gentlemen, we're talking about conics. This is our uh, our first introduction to the different circles, ellipses, hyperbolas, and parabolas. We're going to talk mostly in this particular video about circles and also the ellipses. So uh, first thing I want you to know is the standard form of a circle uh, is the quantity x minus h squared plus the quantity y minus k squared equals r squared. h and k represent the center. The x and y values of the center are being the radius of the circle. So you're going to be asked to graph something like this. x minus 3 quantity squared plus y plus 1 quantity squared equals 16. Well, the center happens to be 3, negative 1, and the radius is 4. So I need to find 3, negative 1. And then I'm just going to go up four units to the right four units, left four units, and down four units from that center value. One, two, three, four. Now, I'm not claiming that I am a perfect artist, so my circles and my ellipses might look the same. But, guess what? When you have your own scale to graph on, it'll be a lot easier. Yeah, it looks more like an ellipse than a circle, but it's pretty close. Um, you, however, do not need to draw a diamond, okay, and then claim that you're a terrible artist. Give it a little bit of a curve to it, you know, so as you're trying to do as good as you can on drawing your circles. Uh, but that's... That's about as hard as it is to graph. You're just identifying your center and your radius. Uh, so once you do that, then you can. You don't need to find a million points to do that. Okay. Um, I know this is going to scare you a little bit, but this is called the general form of the equation of a circle. We talked about the standard form. General form, as you can see, everything has been simplified and moved to the one side of the equation set equal to zero. So uh, that means all your squared terms are together, and you'll notice that it also has the, it starts with the x squared terms, then the y squared terms, then the linear x terms, then the linear y terms, then the constant equals zero. So we want to change this particular equation into that form. So uh, first thing we're going to do is expand this thing. So x minus 3 times x minus 3. Uh, I'm really hoping that we can do that rather quickly, right? Uh, if you need to, you can FOIL, or if you, uh, if you use boxes, which I typically do uh, for Algebra 2, but I'm pretty sure you guys can do it now without, at least for these simple ones. y plus 1 times y plus 1, that would be y squared plus 2y plus 1. Uh, if you need to FOIL it out, then do that. So uh, it's getting a lot closer to being the general form. Uh, so I can start writing x squared plus y squared minus 6x plus 2y. Now you'll notice that I have a 9 and a 1. That's 10. And I'm going to subtract 16 to the other side, so that's going to make a minus 6. 10, take away 16, gives me my constant term minus 6. So here we have it. We have changed it into the general form. Um, not too bad with the circles. Now, I want to remind you about completing the square, since many of you have not completed the square in a while. I'm going to raise this up just a hair so you can have a little bit better view. Ooh, and moving all around. Okay, there we go. Completing the square, we want to add b squared over 4a. I know that you're saying, well, that's not the way my Algebra 2 teacher did it. My Algebra 2 teacher did it. b over 2, quantity squared. Well, there's a reason why I have that 4 down there in the bottom. Now, if you stay with me for a little while, you'll understand why. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, does that make any difference? Sorry, I'm messing around with the camera. Um, oh, by the way, I need to give a shout-out to the Prindle family. Uh, hi, Prindles. I know you're listening. Um, as well as that imposter that goes around looking like Miss Prindle. We know who you are. You can stop it now. 
Okay, back to the math. So uh, x squared plus 10x, uh, let's see here, 10 squared over 4 times 1 is 100 over 4, which is 25. So that number is what's going to be added. That's completing the square. So this is the perfect square of x plus 5, right? How do I go from a positive 10 to a positive 5? I cut it in half. So that helps me understand uh, how to complete the square. Uh, if I do it again, but I use uh, this term, 20 squared over 4 times 2, that's 400 divided by 8, which is 50. So I will get a 50 in there. Now, uh, you'll notice that all of these can be factored, a, a 2 can be factored out of all of them, and oh look, a perfect square appears. So this is 2 times the quantity x plus 5 squared. Now, this 4 really comes into play here. It really didn't mount a whole lot up here. But it comes into play down here when the coefficient of the squared term is not a 1. So that's why, and when you start seeing some of these equations and you start saying, okay, what am I supposed to add to this side? What am I supposed to add to that side? It helps out if you use the b squared over 4a trick. So if I were you, that's what I would do, especially as we start getting the more challenging stuff. Okay, so now I'm supposed to change this thing into standard form. Well, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to line up my squared term and my linear term of like variable. And over here, then I'm going to line up my squared term and my linear term of like variable. And just for fun, I'm going to move the 20 to the other side. So the big question is, what should I be adding in here? So b squared over 4 times a. I'm going to do it twice for the x's and for the y's. Well, 4 over 4, that's the number 1. So I'm going to add 1 here, and I'm also going to add 1 on the other side. Whatever you add to one side, you must also add to the other. Negative 4 squared over 4 times 1. All right, so that's 16 over 4, which is 4. So I'm going to add a 4 to both sides. Well, what does this collapse down into? This is x plus 1, right? Because I take half of that 2. Sorry, I need to raise it up. Half of that positive 2 becomes a positive 1. Then over here, what does this become? Half of negative 4 is negative 2. On the other side, what do I have? 20, 1, and 4 makes 25. There we have it. We have it in our standard form. Not too bad. Okay, let's try a different one. Okay, so I start lining up all my terms. 2x squared minus 12x plus blank plus 2y squared minus 8y. And just for fun, I'm going to throw the 6. Oops, oops, oops. Better leave myself some room. Let's throw the 6 on the other side. b squared over 4 times a. So that's 144 divided by 8. 144 divided by 8. As if such a thing is even possible. 144 divided by 8. What does that give me? 18. And over here I have negative 8 squared over 4 times a, which is 2. So I have 64 over 8, which is 8. Now keep in mind, if you added 18 to one side, you must add it to the other. If you added 8 to one side, you must add it to the other. Therefore, on the right side of the equation, we have 6 and 18. That's 24, right? 24 plus 8 is 32. All right. Now, let's look at these two as separate groups. I'm going to pull a 2 out of this one. And that gives me x squared minus 6x plus 9. Oh, look, a perfect square. And I'm going to pull a 2 out of this one. y squared minus 4y plus, whoo, not running, giving myself enough room here, 4. Oh, look, a perfect square. 
a squished one, but it is perfect. So this is 2 times some quantity squared. That would be x and minus 3 plus 2 and some quantity squared. That would be y and minus 2. You're cutting it in half. Now the last thing to make it look like uh, standard form is we're going to get rid of the 2 all the way across. That was different than the last question. We didn't have to worry about that. So that gave me x minus 3 quantity squared plus y minus 2 quantity squared equals 16. Oh, look, there it is. I know, fun stuff. Okay, I know I'm rushing kind of, but I need to move on to the ellipse. Okay, now the ellipse has what's called a major axis and a minor axis. Now the major axis is the longer one, and I've tried to write in here major, but it's a little bit difficult to read in there. And I tried to write in here minor in the vertical direction, but it's a little bit difficult to read. So just understand the major axis is the long one, and the minor axis is the short one. Doesn't mean it's vertical and horizontal, because you could have a short fat one, or you could have a tall skinny one. So the major axis and the minor axis could be reversed, depending on the equation. How do I know which one it is? Well, the major axis is actually found by 2 times a. Well, I shouldn't say that. Let me back up. I think that is the bad way to look at it. Um, it is double one of these values, but it's double the larger of the two. So don't get caught up in A's and B's. Whichever one of these is the larger one. So here's your standard form for an ellipse. Looks just very similar to a the, the circle, except uh, these denominators are different. Uh, since the denominators are different, that means you're basically squishing the circle and making it uh, an ellipse. Um, we use A and we use B which obviously I'd have to take square roots of these to find them. We use A and B to determine from the center what kind of movement we need to get to get to these things called vertices. Vertices sit out here on the edge. And the ones along the minor axis are called covertices. So major axis are the, called the vertices, minor axis are called the covertices. And we would use the A, whichever one is bigger. A could be bigger, and if, in the case of A being bigger, since it sits under the horizontal direction, that means it's a short fat one. If I have, if B is a bigger number because it's under the Y, that means that the, it's a, okay, I need to graph um, an, an ellipse looking at the information that I have in this equation. So, for instance, h is 2, I get that right here, k is negative 3, a is the square root of 4, or just 2, b is the square root of 9, or 3. Okay, so in graphing this, we're going to have. Um, the center, I need to find the center, where's that? 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. Uh, A takes me to the left two units and to the right two units. This actually is going to be my minor axis because it's smaller. And up three units and down three units. for my major axis, because it's longer. So, here's my ellipse. Now, one thing that we didn't talk about is the fact that, back here on this graph, there are two places that are very, very special to the ellipse called foci. These two places are called foci. Now, that's the plural. The singular for that would be focus, which many of you need to do. 
anyway, uh, some of you probably should foci. You know, uh, you know, make it a more regular thing and um, perhaps more often in your life. So, um, on the on the ellipse, we can ha we can come up with the distance to that focus. The formula for that would be c squared equals a squared minus b squared. Now, because that could be positive or negative, we have to throw on absolute value bars. And then, obviously, we're going to take the square root. So in this case, we had 4, the absolute value of 4 minus 9, which is 5. And so c is the square root of 5. The foci are found along the major axis. If you look back at that picture I drew for you a minute, you see the foci. They sit on the major axis. And you're going to learn later about what's so special about those two points uh, when you do part of your project for second semester. I know, you're excited about it. Anyway, the foci, radical 5, this distance, radical 5, is used to start at the center going up radical 5. Uh, radical 5, that's a little bit more than 2 units. So I'm going to estimate right there is one of one focus, and then two units, a little bit more than two units down is the other focus. So those are the two foci. So I guess if you wanted uh, coordinates for the foci, you'd have to say that you had two comma, and then we had negative three plus or minus the square root of five because we added and subtracted that distance from the y value because it was the major axis was vertical. If it was horizontal, I'd be adding it to the x value. Okay, so that's graphing. Next on my agenda is to change this into its general form. Here's an ellipse, right? I can tell because the coefficients or the the denominators there are different numbers. By the way, if they were the same number, this would be a circle, but it's not. So in order to change this to its general form, I need to find the uh, least common denominator between 16 and 25. Now, 16 and 25 are, are based, this is based on 2s, right, 2 to the 4th, and this is based on 5s, five, 5 squared. So they have nothing in common, so the only thing I can do is actually multiply them together. 16 and 25 are equal 400. So I'm actually going to take this whole thing and multiply by 400. Now when I do that, 400 divided by 16 is 25. And 400 divided by 25 is 16. But don't forget that you have to multiply it all the way through the equation, including the other side of the equation, and that gives you 400. I know this video is going to be long, so don't crucify me tomorrow, even though I know you'll try. Uh, so anyway, we got 25. Expand this. That's x squared plus 4x plus 4. And then I've got y squared minus 6y plus 9 equals 400. Distributing that, I can have... Oh, I'm off screen or close to it. Whew. Save. Okay, so 25x squared plus 100x plus 100 plus 16y squared minus 96y plus 144 equals 400. Oh, we're almost there. So I, all I've done is distributed the 25 and the 16. Um, start writing your terms. x squared, y squared. Linear x term, linear y term, I've got 100 plus 144 minus 400, because that's coming over the other side. So 244 minus 400, that gives me negative 156 equals 0. There it is, my general form of that equation. I know that was really fun. It's even more fun when you go backwards and change it from the general form to the standard form, because then you're completing the square, and I know you're excited about that. One more of that type, at least to get you started, and then you can probably do this on your own. Uh, find the least common denominator. 
Um, the least common denominator between these two things, in this case, since 4 goes into 16, would be 16 itself. So you can use that value and... When I do that, I end up with x plus 2 quantity squared because 16 over 16 cancels out. 16 over 4 is 4. And 16 times 1 is 16. So we can expand this using our foiling techniques. That didn't work out so well, did it? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 4y squared minus 8y plus 16 equals 16. x squared plus 4x plus 4 plus 4y squared minus 32y plus 64 equals 16. Write your terms. x squared plus 4y squared plus 4x minus 32y. We got a 4, we got a 64, and then we're going to subtract a 16 to the other side. So 68 minus 16, that gives me positive 52, and there is your general form. I would salute it since it's in general form, but I'm too busy. Okay, changing this back into standard form. A little bit more difficult because you're going to have to complete the square. So we're going to have to practice this in class. I've got 16x squared minus 96x plus something, plus 9y squared plus 18y. And just for fun, I'm going to move the 9 to the other side and make it negative there. OK, so I've got my, my linear terms and my quadratic terms all set up. I want b squared over 4 times a. Yowzers, that looks ugly. Da -da -da. Uh, and let's see, 140. Okay, let me finish it up. I know this kind of like miraculously appeared. Uh, I had some problems with my video, so, uh, but I think I'm, I'm good to go now. Uh, so let's see here. I would pull out a 16 out of these, giving me x squared minus 6x plus 9. Oh, look, a perfect square. And I would pull a 9 out of these, right, the coefficient of the y squared term, giving me y squared plus 2y plus 1. Oh, look, a perfect square. Then I could continue to collapse this down into x minus 3 squared, and then the 9 times y plus 1 squared equals 144. Now, the last trick of this whole thing is to divide by this number on the right-hand side so that... I can get this to be equal to a big fat 1 on the right. Now, 16 goes into 144 nine times. And 9 goes into 144 16 times. Therefore, here is our equation. And I know you're going to need help with this because this is not the easiest thing in the whole wide world. I got one more that I want to, to do here uh, before we're done today. Okay, it's this one right here. Okay, now, so I'm going to get my squared term and my linear term together and leave a blank for my constant there. And then I got my squared y term and my linear term, my blank there. And then I'm going to move the 64 to the opposite side, making it negative. Uh, out uh, b squared over 4 times a. Oh, let's see here. What do we got there? 32 squared divided by 16 gives me 64. So I got a 64 here and a 64 there. And a b squared over 4 times a, that's going to be 100. And so I add 100 to both sides. Out of these three, I want to pull out a 4, right? The constant of the squared term giving me x squared minus 8x plus 16. Oh, look, a perfect square. And pull a 25 out of these four, three terms right over here, giving me y squared plus 4y plus 4. Oh, look, another perfect square. And the sum of those values on the right-hand side is 100. 
Okay, next, uh, I collapsed down the perfect square. That's x minus 4, quantity squared, right? Because you took half of that value. And 25, and you get y plus 2, quantity squared, equals 100. I know I'm doing this really quickly, so I'll have to explain it if you are getting stuck. And then I divide by 100, right? Because I want that side to be a 1. Well, if I divide that by 100, i got to divide that by 100. i got to divide that by 100. 4 goes into 100. 25 times, 25 goes into 100, 4 times, I know a lot of you are saying, well, don't they just switch places? Um, you be careful with that because we can get some nasty ones, This, these just happen to work out this way. And therefore, we are in the final form we needed in, standard form.